The Canadian music scene lost several greats over the past few years. Leonard Cohen, the tragically hip scored Downey, and most recently Russia's Neil Peart, to name just a few. That prompted much reflection on how such stars helped define a Canadian identity. Now, a younger generation is topping charts around the globe and making no apologies for its stardom. Is this group emblematic of a change in the Canadian identity, too? Let's figure that out with, in New York, New York, freelance music journalist John Deckel. And here in our studio, Kiana Rooks Eastman, music executive and CEO of Sandbox Studios. Alan Cross, music journalist and host of the radio program, The Ongoing History of New Music. That's on Toronto FM radio station 102.1 The Edge. And Aaron Ashley is here, hip-hop editor of Exclaim magazine, and we're delighted to have everybody around this table and John to you in New York City for this conversation today. And I want to... Okay, Alan, I want to just start with this. I said Neil Peart. Correct. And I know there's a bunch of people watching right now who think I mispronounced. No, uh, trust me, it is Peart. Good, all right. Okay. Having said that, uh, I gave the list of some of those who we have just lost in the past few years. And I want to know from you what you think this country lost as a result of their deaths. Well, these are three towering figures in Canadian music. Uh, Neil Peart was the guy that made me want to get into music and play drums. Gord Downey was the national symbol and conscience. Uh, Leonard Cohn was our great poet laureate uh, for, for many years. So to lose three big people like that is, is, is a blow to the Canadian uh, music industry. But at the same time, uh, we have a lot of people coming up that will perhaps one day uh, rank alongside them. We shall come back to that in a moment. I'd like to get your take on that because you, you, you are not of Leonard Cohen's generation. I am not. You're not of Neil Peart's generation. And no. yet, how do you regard their departures? I can understand how important they were to the Canadian industry, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, I'm a you know, child of immigrants. We did not listen to that music growing up in my household. So my relationship to that music is completely different than maybe the general Canadian landscape. Hmm. Um, overall. John, how would you answer the question? Yeah, I think there's a bit of a change of the guard situation, a uh, sunrise, sunset. Uh, it's allowing a new generation to have their Canadian heroes, so to speak, and really uh, to put a new face on Canadian music to the rest of the world as well. How, Alan, did they contribute to Canada's sense of itself? Well, with Leonard Cohen, he was a guy whose material was studied at the PhD level. Uh, he was a, 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 a major poet and songwriter from the 1960s, he was a novelist. He kind of disappeared for a while, but they came roaring back in the 1980s and became this giant icon of Canadian uh, art, uh, lack of a better term. Um, he was the senior, senior fellow with everything to do with Canadian art and literature and music. Uh, Neil Peart, he was regarded as one of the best, if not the best, rock drummers ever. And that is amazing. Say that again. He was one of the best, best ever. drummers ever. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at any um, you know, uh, surveys about the best drummers in the world, he's always in the top five, if not the top guy on the list, mm -hmm. with Keith Moon and John Bonham and all the other people he cared to mention. He was that good. He was so well regarded by his peers that uh, people were, were just... You know, there's shock that he's gone because he was so good. Um, Gord Downey, uh, not an international star, but certainly the conscience of Canada in so many different ways. He is uh, unofficially the, or officially now, the uh, Poet Laureate of Ontario. Yes. And they named it after him. They named it after him. And the other thing, too, was that Gord and the Tragically Hip, they did a couple of things. First of all, uh, they made it cool, or at least not cheesy, to sing about Canada. Before they came along, it was like, okay, you know, Canadian music, Canadian geography, Canadian history, that's all kind of, you know, uh, wildlife who's who kind of things. <laughs> Broccoli, you eat it because it's good for you. Uh, Tragically Hip comes along, and you know what? I'm proud of my country. I'm glad this band is singing about it in a non-cheesy way. And then Gord gets into the whole reconciliation situation, adding an awful lot of dialogue to that particular issue in, in the country. So to have him go, who is leading that charge, was a, was a really big, big deal. Now, if I can pick up on John's expression about a changing of the guard, and Kiana, I'll bring you in at this point. We have a lot of, well, you want to call them new international superstars on the scene? We got Drake, we got The Weeknd, we got Alessia Cara. I mean, the list goes on. They are unapologetically more out there than these other guys. 
How do you regard it? Uh, I think that there's a couple of things that are happening at the same time. One, the world is more out there. We live in a social media world where, you know, you can see everything that's happening. Before, you didn't know if Diana Ross was, like, eating today, like if she went to Chipotle or something. like. <laughs> but now you have the opportunity. I can't imagine Diana Ross <laughs> Chipotle. <laughs> well, not the Chipotle. Okay. Yeah, right but, that. you know, like, now we can see everything. So I think that the, the two things that are happening is that we have mega stars from Boy Wonder, who, you know, is winning a ton of producer awards, to Party Next Door, who's a, a you know, a really well regarded writer to 1985. Even the people behind the scenes in music right now are writing for some of the biggest stars in the world. So, you know, this idea of modesty changing, I think, A, we, you know, people forget that that urban music as well comes from a place of bravado, right? It was a place of, I need to be seen, I want to be seen. And I think so, you described it as braggadociousness. <laughs> Bragg you know, like, like I'm here yeah. I am, because uh, urban music typically in, in, when we talked about genres, was a disregarded genre, and that is a big part of the reason that I think it's, it's so much more in our face now on the Canadian landscape, because we have some of the biggest urban stars in the world, and urban just transitioned from being its own genre to pop music. It is officially pop music now. John, let me get your take on that though, because there, there is a certain, again, to use Rooksy's word here, there's a certain braggadociousness about, about this new upcoming generation, or I guess now established generation of uh, Canadian superstars that, that uh, you know, Anne Murray would not have gone for that kind of thing. Uh, Bert, Bert, uh, 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 Gordon Lightfoot was not out there bragging about how fantastic he was. How's this transition going? Sure. Uh, it's, it's also a bit of uh, recontextualization of what pop music is, as uh, Rooks pointed out. Um, you have to consider what uh, the braggadociousness, if that's a word, uh, you have to kind of put that in the context of, of hip hop music and also put what Gord Downey did in the context of kind of uh, localization of rock music. Uh, the way that both consider authenticity is, is a little different. Um, so when you look at someone, since I'm in New York, I'm going to uh, perhaps uh, bring up the Velvet Underground, which in rock was a very, very specific band, they, they spoke about uh, New York, and that let them uh, an air of authenticity, but I don't, you know, it's, it would be very hard to consider them a pop band, per se, whereas someone like Drake, uh, that kind of taking his city on his back is considered a, a, a good thing, you know, and it, it allows him to speak to a larger audience. Uh, so putting that all in context and coaching it in that idea, uh, you get a different sense of what, what is possible uh, in terms of kind of taking your city on your back or taking your country on your back and saying, yes, I'm from this place, yes, this place is great, and everybody should come to me rather than me pretending I'm from New York. Alan. There was always a, a big deal about rock bands selling out, hmm. you know, selling out their art. Uh, with hip hop and rap and the current pop in, uh, environment, it's not about selling out, it's about cashing in, hmm. which is a completely different thing. Hmm. And that is leading to, again, this braggadociousness, which is an essential part of, of, of this music. Well, I also think it has to do with the fact that if you actually go back to the roots of, of hip hop, everybody would, and I'm sure Aaron can speak to this, it was a part of creating music that I'm from the Bronx, mm -hmm. I'm from Atlanta, I'm from Texas. Mm -hmm. So I think that now that the music it's always been weaved into the fabric since day one in the culture of the music. So now that we actually have our own Canadian yeah, what neighborhood stars, were you from? What yeah, city that, were that you from? That was always a part of the music from uh -huh. 30 years ago until this day. And so our stars being from this space, because you don't see Alessia Carr saying, hey, I'm Canadian <laughs> in every song. But if you have people that are from a genre where it's important to you know, represent your culture, to bring your culture to the forefront, that is always what hip hop has done. From yeah, you don't one. see it with 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 the weekend. You don't see it with Alyssa yeah. Carrier. You don't see it with uh, Justin Bieber. You do see it with Drake. Yeah, you I know he has right. you know been the city's greatest ambassador. Countries. The country's Country greatest ambassador <laughs> uh, since I don't know who. Yeah. You uh, now you've worked with Drake, have you not? I have had the opportunity to say that yes. <laughs> and uh, okay, so for you know, for my generation, yeah. help explain how he put Toronto on the map. Um. Well, I think that. In so many ways from, you know, just one, he's an incredible writer and people in the industry love him uh, for his writing. And so he he's done a lot for other artists. He um, has really openly claimed Toronto. A lot of stars and a lot of people when they work in entertainment from Canada go and live in L.A. They go and live in New York. You know, Drake is here over the summer playing volleyball with his friends, <laughs> you know, up in by Yorkdale or, you know, he's he's created things in, in Toronto like OVO Bounce, OVO Fest. Um, he's done so many things to bring back. He's got that nice crib on the bridal yeah, path. I was too. just yeah. going to say he's <laughs> created a lot of jobs up there. Exactly. Too. Yeah. He, he's, he built his, his home in, in Toronto. Yeah. 
Go ahead, John. And moreover, he's also done this. Sorry. Moreover, he's also done the summit. You know, he he's he's made Toronto and the idea of Toronto an important part of his music and his his global brand. Well, and I and I guess Aaron, I mean, the whole Raptors thing too has just you yeah, know, he's so closely associated with Toronto Raptors basketball, right? And that's international now. Absolutely. I think there's one missing element from this, you know, this narrative is that. Rap has never been seen as a profitable genre in Canada. So to have somebody like Drake and to have the producers that he works with and to have artists like Murda Beats, you know, all these artists that are coming up and making this international um, money for us and to say, I am Canadian, that's something that's so important. And that's something that has allowed the industry at large in Canada to start recognizing us and start accepting that, you know, hip hop is pop music um, and it is an important genre for the entire industry to start paying attention to. Let me quote something here from an article that John wrote, and uh, Sheldon, I'll get you to bring this up. Here's John Deckel writing in the National Post uh, a few years ago. Since log drivers first waltzed, Canada's cultural output has been saddled with a reputation for being the uncool, kooky cousin of its neighbors to the south, mm -hmm. especially when it came to the performing arts. Being from Canada was a novelty best explored in warmer climates and cooler locales of Hollywood or Laurel Canyon. Shania and Celine may have dominated the charts in the 90s, and Rush may be one of the most successful bands in the history of rock, but no amount of slapping da bass could make <laughs> Getty Lee hip or tragically or otherwise. <laughs> that all changed in 2015. To paraphrase The Guardian, we've now found ourselves in the midst of a cultural awakening, the rise of cool Canadiana. For the first time since maybe ever Canadian pop artists are proud to be from Canada. The result is a new class of rappers, singers, and former Degrassi stars who would rather run through the six with their woes than move to New York or Los Angeles to make it. Okay, John, follow up. on That's a very nice turn of <laughs> phrase. You had people in the studio here smiling at, uh, at your turn of phrases there, but, but follow up. What else are you trying to say there? <laughs> Well, I, I wrote that in 2015, just for context. Um, <laughs> well, basically, I, <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, it, it, I, I left most of it what I wanted to say on the page, which was that there was this idea that Canada wasn't cool, you know, uh, in the uh, both pejorative and literal sense. It, 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 it was a cold climate place where people didn't, I mean, I think somebody else brought this up earlier. It, it, it wasn't hip to stay in Canada. Um, and now things are different. You know, it's, 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 people are moving to Toronto. People are staying in Toronto. You have artists like Drake, I think Alan mentioned, that, that built a house in Rosedale. And it's, no, it's, you know, it's up he, north. He, he is, <laughs> he's on the bridal path right. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so, anyway, so unlike somebody like uh, Neil Young or uh, Joni Mitchell, uh, who had to go to California to kind of find their muse and find their financial uh, legs. Uh, Drake has stayed in Toronto. Bieber, um, perhaps less so, but he still has a house uh, in and around Toronto. Right. Alyssa Cara still has that. All these people, but Sean Mendez walks his dog downtown, if you're ever around there. <laughs> uh, these, these artists are st still considered Toronto home and, and are proud of it, you know? And in, in a world where you're constantly uh, telling people where you are and what you're doing, it's nice to say, hey, these guys are, are, are actually from Toronto. It's not like uh, Neil Young, who's trying to get a American citizenship now, for well, example. I think the bigger um, impact that Drake actually had, and we always talk about the artists, is actually the industry. You know, Drake's lawyer, Chris Taylor, his mm. firm has increased its value. Uh, you know, all of the other people surrounding it from, you know, Ahmed, who now runs House with Lamar. Mm -hmm. There's so many other extensions that have developed the industry here, why I think people are able to stay here and why people are attracted. LeBron wants to come and watch Ovio Bound. So, you know, we're always talking about artists, and I think that's where we get a little bit lost in Canada, is yes, our artists are doing really well, but the peripherals, the people who support the industry have actually grown their step. My brand has been more established because of the people who continue to work in this space. So Anybody have a last name anymore? <laughs> all, the people, all the people you just mentioned have only got one name. I only got one name too, so, yeah, so but yeah. Um, Alan, you wanted to say. Yeah, there, there, there has been a problem up until recently where Canadian record labels can't break an artist internationally. They have to go and use the resources of their American parent company, which is why you have somebody like Justin Bieber living in uh, uh, Calabasas in California. It's why you have Drake going down to the US, which is why you have uh, The Weeknd having a very nice penthouse in New York City these days. In order to break it internationally, it's very difficult to do it from a Canadian base. I think only maybe Celine Dion was, is the only one that managed to do it. Everybody else has had to go to America while still maintaining their Canadian roots and their Canadian identity. 
we've had to send them to the U.S. in order to have that big breakthrough simply because they have the resources and the reach. Mm -hmm. hmm. Mind you, I hear, you know, you, when Justin Bieber comes back to Stratford to go visit the folks, he rents the local arena and he plays pickup hockey with uh, Michael Austin Bublé, Matthews. you know, here's another example. I mean, yeah. he's always playing pickup hockey with, with Brian Adams and whoever is around in, in, in Vancouver when he's home. Hmm. Right. Good old Michael Buble. <laughs> Good old Michael Buble. John, in your view, does mentioning Canadiana or that you're from Canada now, does it actually help sell records? Uh, in a certain genre, sure. Uh, and that speaks to, I believe, uh, what Rook said uh, earlier, which is that now Canada has the proper infrastructure and uh, has the sound, so to speak. So, again, you have to look to the producers uh, more than the artists on that one. But uh, now when you say you're from Toronto, people are like, oh, that's... That's where Drake's from, or <laughs> I mean, less so where where the the weekends from. But but in general, you know, it, it, the calling card of being from Toronto, and, and unfortunately, it is very specific to Toronto, not Vancouver, or unless you're in indie rock, uh, Montreal. Um, Toronto itself is kind of a, a hip city. I think there was a statistic that that Drake brought personally, or his brand uh, brought, uh, I, th I think, like nine percent of of tourism dollars to Toronto last year. A couple years ago. Hmm. But anyways, that, that idea that people are coming to Toronto rather than leaving is something new and very exciting for, I'm sure, everybody on the panel. But Aaron, you did see what Madonna said about Canada the other day. <laughs> that we were boring? That we were boring. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> Who was she saying to Harry and Meghan? She yes. said, what do you want to go to Canada for? Come yes. down to me. Right. Rent, rent one of my penthouse apartments right. or something. Except we're not boring in any capacity. <laughs> we're making the best music that we are. We have the championship NBA team, we're not boring. So Madonna's wrong. R Madonna's wrong, in <laughs> all due respect. <laughs> you know, what we're seeing today is actually the result of 40 years, more than 40 years worth of development. Back before the CanCon regulations came into effect in 1971, we didn't have a Canadian music industry. We needed to have this industrial strategy that would not only support Canadians on the radio, but recording studios, managers, venues, agents, promoters, everything that you would need for a first world um, music industry and for the first 15 or 20 years it was pretty awful. I, I well can I follow to... up on that for a second Alan because I when Gino Vanelli sang when I think about those nights in Montreal that's the first time that was I the can... first time I'd ever heard about it exactly too, yeah. Yeah. it's the first time I ever recall a Canadian artist mentioning right out there in the yeah. lyrics that they were Canadian before that was it considered too uncool to do that it was I mean you would get play, you know, um, actually, no, Neil Young would have talked about a place in North Ontario okay. in one of his early songs. Uh, but at the same time... And, and, and Jody Mitchell, and uh, and the Guess Who, I believe, also... Well, running back to Saskatoon. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah but I'd, and Portage yeah, of Maine. Exactly. But yeah. I'd have to disagree a little bit with what, with what CanCon brings to the table in terms of what's happening right now in that 40-year history. When I go into the States and there the amount of radio stations in New York alone that are urban music stations. There's 10 powerful urban music stations, and we have a commercial two urban station here that's playing Drake maybe once every six hours, whereas Power 90 set, all these radio stations are playing urban music nonstop. I hear more Canadian content in America than I do actually here in the radio when we're talking specifically to the genre that is dominating the music industry internationally right now. Mm. So if CanCon is a part of what's creating that opportunity, and you know, I'm sure Eric can, Aaron can echo that in our genre specifically, you're not gonna go through the radio and hear Party Next Door's latest single. You're not gonna hear all of the artists that are big online mm -hmm. and that can go to the States and tour on radio here or on TV here or in placements on Canadian television here. So I can't specifically say that CanCon is keeping this genre bolstering or growing. No, but it wouldn't life. exist the way it, it does today had it not been 40 years of Canadian content uh, regulations making sure that um, people, you know, create the infrastructure but if that's the required. the music that is booming right now the, doesn't play on Canadian. No, no, but that's not my, that's not my yeah. point. But that music wouldn't yeah. exist. They wouldn't have the infrastructure to create that music to go elsewhere if that infrastructure had not been laid over the past 45 years. Mm -hmm. Aaron, you want to come in? Break to this tie. A, to a degree. Um, when we look at the Canadian music industry, the infrastructure has never allowed Black artists, Indigenous artists, to thrive. Um, so we are looking at this industry from the standpoint of the past 10 years, and that has allowed, you know, hip hop to suddenly rise to the, to the capacity that it has. But in a grand scheme of things, Rooks is right. Like, we don't have enough support in this country right now for this genre. De define support. 
support in terms of financial support. We don't have Wait, we have Factor, we have uh, yeah, but Star Maker, been, we have... Uh, look at how, look at who gets Star Maker right. and Factor. You can't look at Drake. Sorry, you just tell me, what, what what's Factor so and Star Maker? So Factor is a... Shout out Factor. I love Factor. I'm a jury member. <laughs> right. Proud of Factor. But when we look at, uh, you know, all the government bodies that fund music and fund music companies and fund recording studios and fund music videos, urban music is not... But a this grant. is all based on, 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 on writing grants and applying for right, these things. Right, but then you have to look at the language that's in those grants and it's disproportionate. If I don't have a post-secondary education, I can't understand that grant. And that's something that well, has I'll tell targeted... You, anybody who does get a grant has to get a grant writer to do that. But, but that also comes down to money. But, we don't have $300 to give to anybody to just, you know, pass off to write it, a grant that we might get back. Even, even, right? be, even beyond that, though, beyond the grant and who can afford it and who can't afford it, if we look at the grant and the funders, because you have to say, you know, how many of the number one stars have any of the grant systems been able to say that they personally like All of them, all of them. I mean, there are record labels right now, the big major record For labels sure, have fans. grant yeah. writers who are actually writing grants on behalf of the artists that they have on their roster. Absolutely, but if I am an 18 year old kid and I'm coming from a underserved community, I don't have money to give to a grant writer to write that grant. So that's an and you also just said the big record labels. <laughs> the big record labels right. aren't looking I, at. Let me get John on this. John, John, what's your just back to the original argument? What's your view on whether or not people like The Weeknd or Drake, Alessia Cara, whether they could have had the success they have today, if not for an industry that had been incubated by CanCon regulations going back to the 1970s? So, so uh, not to be kind of a fence straddler. But I agree with both of you guys. Um, I think that, uh, to Alan's point, you have to create that infrastructure, and the infrastructure was 100% created by those CanCon rules. When you listen to an artist that was from Canada in, uh, before the CanCon rules, uh, they just sounded off on the radio, so they had to kind of come up to meet each other. Uh, on the other hand, as a result of that, you have a certain uh, gatekeeper, which doesn't allow for uh, certain genre-based artists to, uh, you know, the, the, the playing field on that was not even. So I agree with both of you. I think that, that ultimately the CanCon rules helped Canada establish a culture, but perhaps that culture needs to be revamped. Mm -hmm. But Aaron, we're, we're almost in a boundaryless or borderless world today when it right. comes to music. The right? signals fly all over the place. Right. The internet has, you know, some people would argue the internet has made CanCon or the CRTC or these kinds of regulators irrelevant nowadays. Right. So is this kind of thing still important? I mean, it's, it's still important. For sure, it's still yeah. important. It still gives us an upper hand to, as Canadian artists, as a Canadian industry, to be heard. Um, but when we have, you know, streaming now, when we have, you know, platforms that, that you don't necessarily, are not regulated by CanCon, how does that, you know, how does that play into our world today? And how does that leverage Canadian artists when you still have CanCon, but you have a bigger platform when you are able to just occupy the space that is not regulated. Are you saying we should get rid of Canadian content regs altogether? I'm saying that it might have to be updated to 2020 yeah. in a digital space. Oh, yeah, it, it I agree 100%. Does. Like, I think that one of the challenges, Netflix came into our market and they don't have to apply by the CanCon right. rules, right? And so when you have Netflix that's making so much money in the Canadian entertainment industry and they're not having to make sure that their songs are, I think that CanCon is an important piece of mm -hmm. making sure that we are able to compete with 330 million people <laughs> south of us right. for a 31 million population. Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure that it's we're, we're going in that digital space. We're making sure that Apple playlists represent us, Spotify playlists represent us. Any digital streaming platform in Canada from film, TV, and music that wants to exist needs to abide by the CanCon rules. Yeah, and there's a problem with, with a lot of these streaming companies that none of them even pay sales tax yeah. on yeah. what we pay them. So there's this that giant sucking sound you hear is all our Canadian dollars going to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that the uh, the government is going to be looking at over the next 18 months in terms of a radio review and a broadcasting review. You know, how do we even the playing field? Because radio, traditional radio right now, puts millions of dollars into the system mm -hmm. every single year. Meanwhile, the new technology, which is mostly foreign based, doesn't have to do the same sort of make the same sort of investments mm -hmm. in our ecosystem. That has somehow got to change. Well, mm -hmm. how do you how do you capture them in a Canadian content world where there are no boundaries and they're not domestic players? This is the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is we are living next to the to an elephant, the greatest ex net exporter of popular culture on the planet. And if we don't do something, it is, you know, we can have all the, the global platforms that we want, if we don't do something to maintain the support of what we give our domestic artists, we're in big trouble. Do you think 
Rooks, that the people behind CanCon are too focused on building artists as opposed to something else. Yeah, I think that one of the struggles that I see overall in the music industry in general is just that Canada focuses a lot on the expression of art, and I think we need to, you know, focus as well on the industry uh, that creates and supports an artist, right? Like, if we are constantly thinking about funding going to, like, for example, you know, an artist being able to write are going to get a grant. Like in another system, when we talk about the elephant, the reason the elephant is so big is because the elephant recognizes talent, goes out, gets the talent, gets the, the, the talent, the 20 things that they need. Whereas in Canada, the, the talent has to recognize what it needs, go out and get the, it's such a reverse I, I, I disagree system. with that because in, in America, the idea, they don't have the support systems that we have when it comes to. No, they have record labels that will throw $100,000 to an artist that they yeah, don't even Yeah, we don't have in. record labels that have, right. have $100,000. Instead, have Factor and Star Maker and any of the number of grants that you can Which get. I absolutely believe in, but getting a grant, being possibly getting a twenty-five hundred dollar. When we look at Factor and Radio Star Maker and all of these places, Factor, you know, unless you have gone out to the U.S. and you know had like three uh, shows in the states, your star rating doesn't go up. If you haven't, like, everything is by a rating system, so twenty-five hundred dollars uh, that you can apply for twice over the span of twenty-four months versus the ability for a label to say, "Here's fifteen thousand dollars." I think that in general, the investment has to be. Are we able to recognize, like, you know, Erin's been writing for Exclaim for a very long time. She's written all over the place. She has, you're part of a, a Netflix series as well, Hip Hop Revolution. Is this somebody that we then go and pump $50,000 in to give her own online digital platform so that we can create... You'd be okay other... with that, wouldn't you? I'd be great with that. Yeah. Right? Like, this Love is... Love Exclaim, this is, I, I, just think that, I just think that that's what I'm seeing a lot more. And I just mentioned earlier today that I live in the States part-time now uh, in Atlanta, which is a system that I'm seeing say, hey, we need to recognize things before they blow up so that we can pump our dollars into them so there's an ROI. So I do agree with the, the grant system, but also with the grant system, I think if there was more of a connected ROI in terms of, you know, we're going to give this person $2,500 because we recognize the things that they need and we're going to be able to create these supports and that's going to bring $10,000 right. into the let economy. Me, let me get Aaron on this just so I can better understand this. Mm -hmm. If we've, I mean, we do have a finite pool of money to invest in this. Right. Is it better to try to give it directly to artists to create stars or is it better to put it towards a, a system that theoretically will just allow those who are the best to rise to the top? I mean, realistically, it's better to give it to artists directly and allow them to manage what they do with that. Not to say it has to go to every artist, but those who can actually have a business plan ready, who know what they're doing, who are already, you know, trudging the lines of the states in here, who are export ready. I think mm -hmm. we need to start giving money to people who are export ready before we start losing our artists, which we have time and time again. We lose them to the states, we lose them to Europe, and then eventually they come home and they're still not recognized. Um, you know, I was looking at the Canadian Hall of Fame and who's in it the other day, and of the 59 inductees, there's only one black person, there's only one Cree person, there's only one brown person. So why can we not recognize our own, both in funding and both in, you know, general excitement for being a Canadian artist? I'm gonna show my ignorance here. The, the Canadian Music Hall of Fame you're talking about? Yes. Where is that? Uh, I believe it's in uh, Calgary. In is the it the National, National Music Music, Yeah. It is, Yeah. okay. And why, why are those numbers as lopsided as they are? That's a good question. Um, it has to do, I think, with the fact uh, of, you know, of, of how the Canadian music, there hasn't been a home for the Canadian Music Hall of Fame until the National Music Center. So it's kind of lagged. You know, you can uh, nominate something, somebody for it, but uh, what does that mean? It was a virtual amorphous thing. Now that we have a physical home for it, this this will change. I think John spoke to something that really important of like the changing of the guard. Mm -hmm. And you know, we all have our perspectives and you know, I, I feel really lucky to be able to sit at this table. But one of the biggest things that I think that um, Canada needs to recognize is that, you know, immigrants, I'm a first generation Canadian. Immigrants are the people who are making the music industry what it is right now in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they often have been outside of the system that works, you know, like I can, work all over the world, uh, and I'm still not recognized very much so in Canada for the work that, that I do. That is not a new phenomenon no, of a Canadian no. artist being better recognized outside the country yeah. than inside oh, the that's country. Oh, that goes back... Yeah. That goes back 150 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, 100%. <laughs> but especially for first-generation kids hmm. and immigrants, it's even a harder system to crack. Hmm. John, let me... Uh, we got about five minutes to go here, and I just want to ask you, when it comes to producing internationally, 
successful artists who are from this country, you know, some would argue we're in the midst of a golden age of, of Canadian music right now. Are you on that page? 100%. I think that we are. Uh, the fact that we're sitting here having this discussion kind of is an offshoot of that idea of that, uh, to quote, uh, to, to misquote The Guardian as I did in 2015, that kind of cool Canadiana, the, the, the belief that we can exist alongside Americans and the UK in terms of our production. And uh, just to kind of reiterate uh, Rooks's point, I think that that should indicate that a change of the guard is needed. The gatekeepers need to be changed to recalibrate what Canadian uh, output is and, and what we should be funding in this country. But there, there's there's yeah. all kinds of market forces at work here. There's all kinds of demographic forces. There are all kinds of ethnographic forces that that are working. Um, it's a it's it's an evolving situation. Uh, Canadian music really started to come into its own with the rise of uh, can rock in the 1990s, and that's when this nationalistic thing began to take hold, where people demanding Canadian music from Canadian artists and supporting them both by buying records and going to shows. Uh, that was the beginning of that. Um, that groundswell of pride in Canadian stuff begins with a tragically hip, really, and moves forward. Now, you know, with with the changing face of the Canadian population, it's going to evolve. It's going to change into something else. Uh, in most parts of the world, uh, you know, rock and roll is not the cultural driver it used to be. In the United States, hip hop and rap is definitely the number one music. Uh, rock, if you look at the numbers, is still leading in Canada, but hip hop and rap is coming up right behind it. And country. And well, country, mm. you know, ebbs and flows right, right now. And and there's a big issue about women in country yes. right now. They're being so terribly underrepresented. Absolutely. But as a as a nation of 36 million people, we have long punched above our weight mm -hmm. on the national stage, 100%. international stage. I mean, we're the number five or number six in the world in terms of the music market, depending on what happens with Australia in any given year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're gonna, you know, if, 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 if our ethnographic, demographic uh, makeup demands that we change into something else, it'll change. But it, it, I mean, I'm assuming that guys who are closer to our age mm -hmm. are more into the rock and roll. Mostly. And people who are closer to these two age, they're into the new stuff. Yep, pretty much. You know, yeah. I, I grew up in, in Canada. One of my favorite things about being from Toronto is that I got to listen to Alanis Morissette. I got to listen to Billy Talent. I got to listen to Nickelback. And I also got to listen to, you know, Cardinal Official and mm -hmm. Julie Black and all of mm -hmm. these other people. I think the, the biggest challenge we're having right now is just the fact that the guard doesn't, I, like I love sitting here next to Alan because I've been on panels with him before and sitting here, it's about merging everything that's yeah. happening. It, it's about having the perspectives come together so that we can create a better economy for artists in Canada because the other piece of this is audience development. And if we don't have a shared audience and like when you go to the States and you look at who's in a concert at any given time, especially in urban music, it's so mixed. Mm. And so I think that us making sure that we are getting together, that we're having these conversations and we're sitting down at tables like this to share perspective, this is how we start to, I don't want to change the guard, let's join forces and make sure that we're, okay. we're with, building a stronger Canada. With a minute to go here, John, let me throw the last question to you. And that is you, you work with the CBC, okay. I gather, to, to help produce that Tragically Hips last concert, which was so iconic uh, for so many people. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, from what I hear, your girlfriend had something to say about those efforts. What did she say? <laughs> well, we, we, we were sitting in the cinema at, uh, at um, uh, CBC and uh, watching the last concert. She just said, you know, it's very, you're, you're, you're part of something special. And, and it was something special. It, it united a country in, uh, trying to find its identity. And I think to Alan's point earlier, Gord saw that as a good platform to to talk about indigenous issues. Um, and then to Rooks's point, I think the kind of melding of the guard uh, is, for that to happen, you need the old guard to recognize that it needs to be melded. And Gord did a good job of that. I'm not the world's biggest tragically hip fan by any stretch of the imagination, but you have to applaud his efforts there. And I think, uh, if I can just bring it back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, the, the CanCon renaissance, if you will, of uh, Matthew Good and Tea Party and, and that era that, that uh, Alan brought up earlier, what changed was, was the internet. I did a story on the CBC about this. What changed was the internet, D democratizing the idea of who can listen to music and how they listen to music, the ability to not pay $30 for a record, uh, for example, the ability for artists to put out music uh, on a, you know, for way less money uh, and have it sound good. That's, that's ultimately what's bringing this all 
to the table, in my mind. Well, we're, uh, the we're all idea for that the Canadian identity can evolve. We're all for democracy on this program. That's John Deckel, freelance journalist, coming to us tonight from New York City. John, thanks for being there in the Big Apple for us. Aaron Ashley, Alan Cross, Kiana Eastman, so great to have you here Thank in our you. studio Thank in Toronto. You. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.